it's uh, a blessing to be back. And I appreciate all of your prayers, uh, and I'm thankful to have gotten on the other side of this, this, uh, this thing. Our call to worship this morning is from 1 Peter, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you, have not now, though you do not now see him, you believe in him, and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are blessed to be together today to worship your name, to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, to thank you, O God, for your great mercy which, with which we have been born again to a living hope. We thank you, O oh God, that our new birth was not caused by anything within us, but was caused by you, that you took out a heart of stone and placed in, this, placed in us a heart of flesh with a desire to worship, with a desire to love you, with a desire to love one another, with a desire, O oh God, to come together and assemble together with your people to offer your you the praise that is due your name. We thank you, O oh Lord God, that our inheritance is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven. Father, that it is guarded by your power, that um, you have guarded our salvation until the day that it was revealed in the last time. And though, O oh Lord, we live in a world that is filled with suffering and trials and temptations on every side, Lord, that you protect us, you, you keep us, Lord. Though we be grieved with various trials, we know that these are only testing the genuineness of our faith so that when we come through on the other side of these trials, Lord, our faith will only be tried and purified as, as fine gold. We praise you, Lord. May we be found in you, Lord, honoring you at the revelation of Jesus Christ and his return. And though we, Lord, do not see you today, we worship you in spirit and in truth. We worship you by faith. We worship you believing and rejoicing with joy that is inexpressible and full of glory because of the finished work of your Son. We thank you, O oh God, that we have a, a prophet, priest, and king who has come to dwell among his people to not only live as an example, which he certainly is, but to take upon himself the very uh, payment, the very uh, cost of our sin, the very wrath that we have deserved and carry it away so that we might be forgiven, so that our sins might be separated as far as the east is from the west. Father, remind us of your gospel often this morning as we sing your word, as we hear your word preached, as we pray your word, as we partake in the Lord's table. Lord, may we hear from you. May we grow into the image of your son. We ask for your blessing on every aspect of the service, that the gospel, that Jesus Christ in his a work in the gospel would ring clear and true in the hearts of every individual here. And if there is anyone that's remaining in darkness, O oh God, that you would have grace and mercy to open up their ears today so that they might hear your voice and open up, their, open up their eyes so that they might see. 
We yet thank you and praise you for our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's uh, stand. And let us sing together, O come, O come, Emmanuel.
rejoice. shall come again with us to dwell. Good morning. We'll be reading from the book of Hebrews, chapter 6. Therefore, leaving the elementary teachings about the Christ, let us press on to maturity. Not trying, press on to maturity. Not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and the church word of God, but instruction about the washing and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. In this we rejoice, but God permit. When the faith of those who have been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify themselves the Son of God and put into open shame. The ground that drinks the rain which often falls on us and brings forth vegetation useful to those who whose sake is also pure, receives the blessing from the vine. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. But, beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you, the things that accompany salvation, though you are speaking in this way. For God is not unjust, so as to forget your work and the love that you have shown toward his name. And having ministered and still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. So that you will be not so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators, but imitate of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. And so, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. In the same way God desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and watch which one which enters within the veil, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The reading of God's perfect word. Jesus Christ is the hope of glory. Let us come and adore him and behold the wondrous mystery of the cross.
Christmas mystery in the dawning of the King. He the theme of heaven's praises, realm and frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. Come behold the wondrous mystery, be the perfect Son of Man. In His living, in His suffering, never trace nor stain of sin. See the true and better Adam come to save the hell-bound man. Christ the great and sure fulfillment of the let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Oh, come, let us adore him. the Lord upon the tree. In the stead of ruined sinners hangs the Lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption. See the Father's plan unfold. Bringing many sons to glory. Grace unmeasured love unfold. Please join me in prayer. <clears throat> Almighty and heavenly Father, worthy of all praise, we come before you with a humble heart and a repentant heart. This week, we got caught up with the world instead of your word. We desire time with our phones and with other distractions. Father, our moods our attitudes, our mental states, lived and died by social media and, and the news rather than your holy word, rather than your truth. Too often, Lord, we shared in each other's burdens only when convenient and on our time. We transgressed and we forgot that we hurt you most of all. 
But Lord, you are mighty to save. Our sins were paid by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the cross. Father, we, we rejoice in seeing the Lasardo family back. We, we give you thanks for healing them and for Pastor Damien as well. And Father, we pray for healing for Pastor Lou. We pray for healing for Randy and Rochelle, Lord. Please shield them from the symptoms of COVID, Father, and keep them strong during this time. Father, we pray for comfort for the Chiagaros. Lord, be their rock and shelter during these difficult times. Bless them, Father, be their strength, and raise up your holy saints to minister to them during this time. Father, we, we pray for healing for our sister Winnie, for her hip, Lord. We also pray for the mother of Elena, a sister in the Lord, and for salvation for her family including her two daughters. We pray for healing for Pam Richardson, and during this time we ask that you save her daughter and grandchildren and the rest of her family through these trials. Lord, we lift up the elders and deacons. Lord, fill them with your spirit as they lead us in these tumultuous times. Guide them with wisdom and discernment. Lord, protect the marriages in your church. Protect them from the enemy and his lies, Father. Let no man separate what you have brought together. Father, shield the children. We ask that you save our children, Lord. Save them and protect them from the influences of the world and those who will try to lead them astray. Keep them strong. Bless parents to raise them properly and instruct them in your holy word. Father, we continue to pray for our leaders. Lord, we lift up Governor Murphy. We ask that you save him, Father. Show him the evils of funding abortion and all the other decisions that he supports. Help him to see you, Lord. Help him to abide in you. And Father, we lift up all those going on out outreaches during these times. We pray for their safety. We pray for their protection. And Lord, strengthen them and just help them, Father, as they go to minister to, to those that are lost. And Lord, we lift up Jim and, and Carolyn Dowdy. We, we pray, Lord, for the Christians in Central America and for the strengthening of your church there. We also pray for the Venecinos family and the newly established congregation. Please be with them and their sorrow in the sudden loss of their pastor, Sanchez, Father. We ask all this in your precious name. Amen. Good afternoon. Please turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. In an interview back in 1989, Romanian pastor Richard Wormbrand recounts a story that he said was the most beautiful episodes that he experienced while in communist prison. After spending time in solitary confinement for his faith, he was put in a common cell with about 200 prisoners. He described it as being hell on earth. The place was filthy, Prisoners were beaten and hungry and could not sleep because of the overcrowding. There were men of, of all walks of life, 
There were generals and the royal army, businessmen, professors, and the rank and file of the populace. There were workmen, there were farmers. One of those farmers was a Christian who knew his Bible well, but he hadn't read much of any other books. His mission was to win to Christ a professor of Royal Academy of Science who was in the same cell. The professor would ask him some questions that he couldn't answer. He told the professor, Sir, I don't know these things, but I, I walk with Jesus and I talk with Jesus. The professor said, What lies are you telling me here? Jesus lived 2,000 years ago, and he's been dead since then. How could you walk with him today? And in fact, if I show you a globe, you couldn't even point where Palestine was, where Jesus lived. And even if it is as you Christians say that Jesus lives today in heaven, do you know where heaven is? Heaven is many light years away from here. How could you possibly walk and talk with Jesus? The Christian man told him, well, you might be right in your thinking, but I walk and talk with Jesus and I see Jesus. The professor was now indignant. He said mockingly, so what does Jesus look like? Does he look bored? Is he annoyed to see you, or is he happy and smiles when he sees you? The farmer said, yes, he sometimes smiles when he sees me. The professor said mockingly, show me how Jesus smiles at you. The farmer, who, like the rest of the prisoners, looked like a scarecrow from the beatings and hunger and lack of sleep, and all of a sudden, his face began to shine, and he was being transfigured right before the professor's eyes. And he said, as Pastor Wombrand records, he said he had the most beautiful angelic smile all of a sudden broke on his face. The pastor says it was the most beautiful sight I had experienced in my 80 years. He was 80 at the time. There was so much love and compassion in his smile and a great yearning desire to see this professor saved. The whole splendor of heaven was in his smile. When the professor saw that, he bowed his head and he said, Sir, you have seen Jesus. In spite of his difficult circumstances, this Christian farmer had the joy of Christ in his heart. And this is the theme of our topic today, rejoicing in our suffering for Christ. Yes, you guessed it, we're back in 1 Peter. I hope you are not getting tired of the theme of suffering. Jesus spoke a good deal about his suffering, and he spoke a good deal about the suffering of the disciples in trying to prepare them for what is to come. Thankfully, we have not known in this country that level of physical suffering, but we are seeing an increase in persecution against those who name the name of Christ and who expose the sins of our culture. And with the current, and with the current moral decline in our nation and the political climate, we may anticipate things to get worse over time. So I pray that these lessons will serve us well when the time comes. Now, having exhorted his readers to be vigilant and to love one another in light of the brevity of time, in verses chapter 4, verse 7 through 11, which we covered last time, he now, in verses 12 to 19, returns to the main theme of the letter, namely, to encourage suffering saints to persevere under trial. And he gives them five reasons why they should rejoice when they are being persecuted for Christ's sake. So let's read the passage together, uh, verse chapter 4, verses 12 to 19. 
Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings that you may, be, you may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Let's ask the Lord's help. Our Father, we thank you again for the freedom that we can enjoy here, Lord, in being able to gather uh, un, unfettered, unhindered uh, by authorities, Lord. We can gather in an open space, in a public facility. We thank you, Lord. We don't take that for granted. As we study these things about suffering of the first century believers, it seems so foreign to us. But yet, Lord, your word is timeless. And we know that you have preserved your word for our instruction, for our edification, Lord, for our equipment that we may be uh, fit for every good work. So we pray that you would use your word, Lord, in a way that would equip us, that should we come to face those kinds of trials, that, Lord, as your people, we too would endure to the end. We pray for your help this morning, by your grace, that you would give your Holy Spirit for me to speak your word and for your people to hear it and to receive it and to apply it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first reason to rejoice in suffering that Peter gives, and it should be all in an outline in your bulletin. If you don't have one, uh, they're on the table outside by the doorway. The first reason that Peter gives for to rejoice in suffering is, he says, trials are part of God's plan to strengthen our faith. Look with me at verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. Notice, first of all, he says, beloved. And he did this again in, in chapter 2, verse 11, where he's starting a new section. He's addressing a new theme. As he was starting in, in that section, in chapter 2, verse 11, exhorting them as to how they were conduct themselves in society. And now he's beginning another section as to how they are to respond to these fiery trials. He calls them beloved. He's being pastoral here. It is a term of endearment and affection. He's showing them that he is not indifferent to their suffering, but he's being sympathetic and compassionate. After all, he himself knows what it was to suffer for Christ. He had left everything for the sake of Christ, to follow Christ. He was, in, he was in prison for Christ, he was flogged for Christ, and he nearly lost his head when Herod, when he, Herod killed James, beheaded James, and he saw that it pleased the, the Jews, so he took Peter, and he was going to do the same, and, the whole, and God delivered him from his hands. So he's not uh, this ivory tower theologian sitting comfortably in his easy chair, smoking his pipe, and writing his epistle. No, he's a foot soldier in the trenches with them. His life was just as much in danger as their life was. Therefore, he can appeal to them and entreat, entreat them, and no one can say, but Peter, you don't understand what I'm going through. Peter says, yes, I do. 
I do understand very well. So he says, don't be surprised at the fiery trials when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange has happened. Why? In, in case that some of them are wondering, why is this happening to me? Why are we Christians being called evildoers and being maligned when we're trying to walk uprightly? We're trying to love our neighbors. Why is our good being evil spoken of? Now, Peter had already told them in 2.21 and 3.18 that Christ, the righteous and sinless one, suffered and was crucified. So should we expect anything different as his followers? In chapter 2, verse 21, he says, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow his steps. As Christians, we're called to follow in the steps of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus told his disciples, he said, the, the world hates you because you're not of the world. If you were of the world, the world would love you. But be assured that the world hated me first. So they shouldn't expect any different treatment than our master received from the world. And in fact, many of these churches, you know, these churches that Peter is writing to in Asia Minor, were born in the crucible of affliction. And so Paul had uh, told them, it says in, in Acts chapter 14, verse 22, when they had preached the gospel to that city, he and Barnabas, this is in Asia Minor, and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of disciples, encouraging, encouraging them to continue in faith and saying that through many tribulation we shall enter the kingdom of God. So right from the beginning, not only did Christ tell this to his disciples, the Apostle Paul told this to the churches that he established right from the beginning, right from the get-go, through many tribulations we shall enter into the kingdom of God. So it shouldn't come as a surprise. A second reason why we should not be surprised at trials, it is not only part of being a Christian, but also the same trials are being experienced by other Christians around the world. This is not unique to us. He tells them in, uh, this in, in chapter 5, verse 9, he says, knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. So you see here, we're kind of sheltered, right? We don't you know, we, we, we hear about things going on in North Africa and in China and in India and in the Middle East and uh, Indonesia and places like that, Pakistan and, and Afghanistan. But we, we're like, we're totally clueless about that. We have, you know, we, what are you talking about? What? A guy's house burnt down and what? They abducted his kids and they're holding him for ransom. What? They... They killed him in front of his wife. Like, you know, this does, just doesn't equate, doesn't compute with our brains. But he says, your brethren around the world are being suffering in the same way. And, so, and then he tells them in chapter 1 Corinthians 10, 13, he says, the temptation in your life is no different than from what others are experiencing. So the reason that he gives them as to why they shouldn't be surprised at, the, at these fiery trials is that these trials are, to, are a design, by design, and not by accident. You see, this, this is not bad luck. This is not bad karma. This is not being in the wrong place at the wrong time. No. Or, or somehow, Satan uh, somehow managed to get God off his... Uh, seed in heaven and took over. And now God is unable to keep him from carrying out his wicked schemes. Uh, uh, you know, somehow God abdicated his throne. No, he has already told them about Jesus being supreme, right? 
we saw that in chapter 3, verse 22. He says, Who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. So everything, including Satan, is subject to the Lord Jesus Christ. Nor is it that God has forsaken the believers and left them to defend for themselves. Because Peter has already told them in chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, as Pastor Joe read earlier, there is an inheritance reserved for them that is kept in heaven, and what? Guess what? And they are being kept by the power of God for that inheritance. Not only is that inheritance kept, but they are kept. So God is not forsaking them, no. He's not. The tendency is for us to feel that God hates us and he has abandoned us when we go through trials. But this is a lie of the devil. He tried to pull this ploy with Jesus, if you recall, when he was in the wilderness. After 40 days of being hungry and tired, and he comes to him and, and he says to him, listen, your father has abandoned you. You've got to take care of yourself, all right? You see those rocks? Turn them into bread. You could do that. Take care of yourself because your father ain't going to take care of you. That's not a good father who leaves his son to be famished like that and not take care of him. Jesus used that illustration. Remember, he says, which one of you, if his son asked him for bread, would give him a stone? So here he's saying, your father is giving you stones instead of bread. Take care of yourself. But of course, as you know, our Lord did not fall for his wicked schemes. No, no, he said, man shall not live by bread alone. He would never, never doubt the love and care of his father. Never. Because he knew his father was a good father. Remember that uh, Jesus, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Job's wife, you know, she tried to tell him, God doesn't care for you, Job. Curse God and die. Get over with it. He wouldn't do it. He would not do it. You no, know, Peter says they are not by accident, but a part of God's design, and he has allowed them to test your faith. Four times in the epistle, he tells them that trials are in accordance with the will of God. In verse 1-6, one, one, I'm going to run through them. He said they are grieved by various trials as necessary to accomplish the purpose for which God has sent them for. As necessary. No more. In 3.17, he said, It is better to suffer to, to, for doing good if it be the will of God. In verse 4.19, he says, Those who suffer according to the will of God should entrust their souls to him. In verse 5, of chapter 5, verse 10, he tells them that their suffering is for a little while. In other words, there is a purpose and there's a duration. And that is controlled by the Lord himself. Look with me at chapter 1, verse 6 and 7 again. We read it, Pastor Joe read it, but I would like, we're going to be, we're going to be here uh, visiting it a couple times. Verse 6 and 7. And this, and this referring to the salvation that is going to be revealed in the last time, you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. These trials have come upon them as what's called fiery. They're burning. They're burning trials. These are not your average trials. These are difficult, consuming. This is your in the crucible of affliction and suffering. Do you, and in the same way that, that gold is purified by fire, God is testing the genuineness of their faith by fire, as if though their faith is this gold and is, he's going to purify it more and more. Do you remember the parable of the sower, how the trials rooted out that plant 
uh, of that seed that fell amongst rocky ground because it had no depths of earth. That was the shallow temporary faith. In the same way, the true faith will be shown to be pure gold, while the temporary faith will be like the wood, hay, and stubble and burn up when you put fire to it, when it goes under trial. It is also, also worthwhile to note that one who is doing the testing is our Heavenly Father. He has his hand on the control knob, on the temperature control knob. You know your stove has a temperature control knob? He has his hand on the temperature control knob, and he's controlling the heat. And says he only allows as much as necessary. Did you notice that word? If necessary, as much as necessary to remove the impurities, no more and no less. He'll only apply what is needed because he knows us perfectly. He knows us perfectly. For us, those two weeks of sickness can seem like a lifetime. Right, Pastor Joe? Three weeks can seem like a lifetime, but compared to eternity, they're very, very, very short. But not only does God has his hand on the control, he is also with us in the midst of the fiery trial. Uh, beautiful verses, I'm sure many of you memorize or know these by heart, Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2, here's what it says, But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you, says, Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you go through the deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned. The flames will not consume you. You see the promise? I will be with you. I will be with you through the fire. I will be with you through the waters. They will not overwhelm you. They will not consume you. Because I am with you. The Lord doesn't leave us to ourselves, brethren. In the same way that he was with the three Hebrew children, there in the fire, in that furnace, he will be with us to comfort and strengthen us more. We'll, be, we'll see more about this point. I was so encouraged to hear the testimony of the Chiyogoros of how God is upholding them in the midst of this painful, severe trial. We praise God for that, the testimony of God's people that they say God is with us. He has not forsaken us. Praise God. A couple of applications to this for self-examination. Now, since trials are to test our faith, how do you and I respond to trials? Now, I realize Peter is addressing here trials that come from identification with Christ, but the principle still applies to the trials that we face in living in a fallen world. Financial problems. Difficult to deal with co-workers or family members. Illness in your life or those close to you. Tragedies and accidents. Political and social turmoil and unrest. Do you find that these trials are growing you in trust in Christ and reliance upon Him? Is He becoming more precious to you? Are you trusting His leading and guiding in your life? Are you trusting him over your bank account? Are you trusting him over your investment and retirement account? Are you trusting him over your spouse and your children? Are you trusting him over your food pantry and your vitamins? Are you trusting him over your medical insurance? over the freedom we enjoy in this country and the great constitution and the Bill of Rights, are you trusting Him over these things? 
Are trials driving you to trust and lean upon Christ and love Christ more? Brethren, if we've learned anything from the events that happened in our country and the world this year through COVID, through civil and political unrest, and through economic hardships, if we've learned anything, it's this. Every security that we trust in can be shaken and pulled out from under us. In a matter of months. Our, tech, our technological advanced healthcare system, our robust economy, our secure jobs, our national stability, all of these things, brethren, can be shaken and removed in a short time. What God is telling us is this. We need to have our security in Him and Him alone. Psalm 146, 5. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth to see in all that is in them, who keeps faith forever. So do you, do you respond to trials with trust, or do you find yourself like the Israelites when they were in the wilderness, questioning God's wisdom, doubting his goodness and providence, Murmuring and complaining about their lot and about their condition. Anxious and troubled about what the future holds. Brethren, if we're honest with ourselves, oftentimes we allow our problems, our circumstances to be bigger than God. Oh yes, I know. We affirm our doctrine, we affirm our doctrine in songs that God is in control. And he's all wise and all loving and all good. But when trials come, we forget all that. And we say, why me, God? What have I done to deserve this? Well, if God gives us what we deserve, brethren, this is nothing. This is a walk in the park. Because what we deserve is an eternity in hell. Second, second by, secondly, by way of uh, self-examination, exam are these trials growing you and me in Christ-like character? In Romans 5, 3 and 4 and James 1 and 2 tells us that trials and tribulations are to produce in us patience, long-suffering, character, hope. Can those closest to you say that you are more gentler, you are more patient, you're more humble? Do they see more of Christ-like character in you? Or are you same old, same old? Still irritable, easily provoked, defensive, argumentative, proud, selfish? If you're still the same, that means those trials were wasted on you. They didn't benefit you. We need to pray that these trials would have their intended effect, but when we go through them, let's not just pray them away and wish them away. Lord, take this. Let's just pray, Lord, accomplish what you will in me. Change me through these to accomplish your purposes that I would become more like your son, Jesus Christ. Two more takeaways from this point. Do you see, brethren, why we should rejoice in trials now? Because it is better to be tested and found to be genuine now than waiting at the day when we stand before the judge of all the earth and he proves us to be phonies. And secondly, as our country becomes more anti-God, expect more persecution to come our way. Don't be surprised if you get passed up for that promotion by your boss and someone else less qualified than you gets it just because your boss doesn't like your Christian views. Don't be surprised when your coworker and neighbor seems to have it out for you just because you are a Christian and told them that Christ is the only way to heaven. 
that they need to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be surprised if they become, they become against you and have it out for you, and you have no idea why, because you've only done them good. So, the second reason, we spent a good deal on this part, the, sec- the, the following will be shorter, The second reason that Peter gives to rejoice when we go through trials, these fiery trials, is this. We have the privilege of sharing in Christ's suffering. Look with me, verse 13a. But rejoice in so far as you share in Christ's suffering. Peter says, instead of being bewildered and surprised, rejoice. And your joy should be proportional to the amount of suffering in so much as you suffer or share in Christ's suffering. Of course, brethren, you know we're not talking about his atoning work on the cross. That, that's not, <laughs> we're not Catholics here, okay? Uh, you cannot share in that suffering. But there is suffering that we do share in identification with our Lord Jesus Christ, when he says you will be hated by all men for my name's sake. Why is it a privilege, though? Why is it a privilege to suffer shame for Christ? In uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 20, 29, it says, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Now, the word granted is Karezomai, uh, it is a compound word. It means to extend favor or grace. Extend favor or grace. He's saying God is extending favor to you and grace, not only to believe, but to suffer. And you say, wait a minute. That's grace? That's favor? Suffering is favor and grace? Indeed. It is an opportunity, brethren, for us to show our gratitude. Why is it favor? Because it's an opportunity for us to show our gratitude for his love for us. What are we saying in suffering for Christ? Here's what we're saying. We're saying, Lord, you're worthy of my name. Lord, you're worthy of my honor. Lord, you're worthy of my reputation. Lord, you're worthy of my wealth. Lord, you're worthy even of my life. We love you and want to see your name increase and our name decrease. That's what we're saying when we're suffering for Christ. You know, we sing it, right? We sing, uh, we sing um, uh, take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold, uh, and so on and so on. My hands and my feet and my riches and so forth. And you know, how <laughs> that's exactly what we're saying here. Is we're saying that all that, Lord, you are worth than, more than all that. That's what we're saying. S- uh, secondly, it's an opportunity to experience more of Christ in our lives. Philippians 3.10, Paul says, what I may know, That I might know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his suffering, becoming more like his death, more like him in his death. Paul wanted to know Christ more intimately. And he said it is by experiencing both the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. In both of those things, he says, that's how I'm going to experience more of Christ in my life and grow more like him. Do you remember when he had that thorn in the flesh? And he prayed three times to the Lord to take it away from him. And here's the Lord's, and the Lord's response was that. But he said to me, he said in in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast, and the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am... uh, uh, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecution, calamities, for when I am weak, then I am strong. What's he saying? He's saying, 
he's boasting and rejoicing in his weakness and persecution because in those things he will experience more of Christ in his life. You want to know Christ more? You want to experience him more in your life? You want to experience more of his power and his presence? Trials is one of those ways. Persecution is one of those ways. The third reason we should rejoice in suffering for Christ is that our joy now will be magnified at Christ's coming. Look with me at verse 13b. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's suffering that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Our joy in sharing in suffering now will be turned into inexpressible joy and full of glory when Christ returns. Again, back please to 1 Peter 1, verses 7 to 9. He says, So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though now you have not seen him, you love. Though you do not know, now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible, filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That faith that was proven now, that faith that was proven now, when Christ comes, it says it will receive Commendation, praise, honor, and glory. That faith that has been, that genuineness of the faith that's been proven now, in that day, Christ, when he comes, Matthew 25, 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come you who bless of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The most beautiful words that we can ever hear. There's Christ's commendation. You faithful servant, you've been faithful and little. Come and inherit the kingdom prepared for you. So he will give us commendation and praise. But not only that, uh, you know, before the whole universe, we will also receive glory and honor. We will receive glory and honor. Romans 8, 17. You can turn there if you like. Romans 8, 17. He says, if children then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Having shared in his suffering, we will also share in his glory. We are co-heirs with Christ, so we will share in his inheritance. He's our older brother. brother. He has gone before us. He's the first that rose from the dead. And the same inheritance that he receives, we will share in that inheritance. Our suffering here is for his sake, is working for us an eternal weight of glory in the life to come. Paul says that in 2 Timothy 4, 7, he says that there is a crown of righteousness that awaits him. But he says it's not only for him but for everyone who loves his appearing. For everyone, that crown of glory. So there is an eternal weight of glory that awaits us uh, who are in Christ Jesus. And verse 14, we have the fourth reason to rejoice in suffering for Christ. And that is, the spirit of glory and of God rests upon us. Look with me at verse 14. He says, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. If you are insulted and reviled for the name of Christ, for, hear, for bearing his name, for believing in his name, and for professing his name, the believers were, at that time, were evil spoken of because they refused to sacrifice to the gods. And they would not walk in the same way as in their previous life with those 
Gentiles, as, as he told us in verse, chapter 4, verse 4, he says, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join uh, them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. So they're being maligned by these uh, previous uh, drinking buddies. Uh, and they're being slandered and evil spoken against. And Peter says, you are blessed. You are blessed. He's quoting from the Lord on the Sermon on the Mount where he says in Matthew 5, 11, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. When people revile and persecute you and say all kinds of bad things about you falsely for the name of Christ, when they call you, when they call you bigot, a woman hater, a homophobe, on, and go on social media and try to defame your good name and character, Jesus says, rejoice and be glad because your reward is great in heaven and you are in good company with the prophets. Now, being in heaven is reward enough. Yet he says there's even a greater reward in heaven that is reserved for you. Now, what I imagine what he's saying is your reward will be the reward of prophets who were despised and rejected in their day for the sake of the message and their testimony. Peter tells us what the blessing is that we experience now is that you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. The glorious Holy Spirit will rest upon you. And he's alluding to Isaiah 11, 2, speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ, the shoot that would come out from, from, the, uh, from Jesse. It says, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. The blessed Holy Spirit, the, the spirit of counsel and wisdom and knowledge and comfort will rest upon you and abide and dwell in you and fill you. There's no greater blessing, brethren, that we can enjoy in this life than to have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? We often shrink back from speaking for Christ because we don't want uh, to be evil spoken of and to fall out of favor with our neighbors and friends. But do you see what we're missing? We're missing the spirit of glory and of God resting upon us. The fifth and final reason we're given to rejoice in our suffering for Christ is it is an opportunity for us to give glory to God. Look with me at verses 15 and 16. But let none of you suffer as an evil, as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Now, we can only rejoice, brethren, if our suffering, as long as our suffering is for the right reason. As Christians, we're to live above reproach. We're to adorn the gospel of our, uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ with our lives. We're to be a fragrance of Christ to the world. They are to see Christ in us. His humility, his gentleness, his love, his compassion for souls and for sinners. It would be a shameful thing and dishonoring to Christ if we were to suffer for these sins that he mentions a murderer or a thief. That would be a disgrace to the name of Christ for someone bearing the name of Christian to be guilty of these crimes. A third one he mentions is an evildoer. This is more of a general description of a bad person, someone guilty of immoral conduct, lying, cheating on your spouse, etc., Sadly, we're seeing a number of high-profile Christian leaders falling into immoral sins lately. And it is giving the world cause to mock and to look down on us. Then fourthly, he says, a meddler. A meddler. The word is where we get the word overseer. It's a compound word 
basically it's overseeing others' affairs, meddling in other people's business, overseeing, you're, you're looking over other people's business. Now, if it was us, we certainly wouldn't put that in the same category as a murderer, as a thief, as an evildoer, would we? Well, guess what? The Holy Spirit does. And so we need to look into this a little more. How can we know if we are being busybodies or genuinely caring about and, and wanting to help people? I found this article online that I thought is very helpful to help us in self-examining ourselves to see whether or not we are this meddling. He says, a busybody is a person who meddles in the affairs of others. Sometimes this meddling is under the guise of helping. But usually to help is welcome, unwelcomed. I'm sorry. Usually the help is unwelcomed and uninvited. Busybodies are often people who are dissatisfied with the level of drama in their own lives and gain satisfaction by becoming involved in the problems of other people. Gossip is usually a staple of every busy body, but it is camouflaged as a prayer request. Like, uh, uh, you know, uh, brother so-and-so has a problem, uh, we need to pray for him, or, or sister, or given under the a pretense of asking for advice. Hey, how would you handle this situation? If there's a brother or sister over here, and they've got this situation, how would you handle that. The author gives us 10 questions to ask before we get involved. One, is this any of your business? Two, has God given you this assignment? Three, are you qualified to involve yourself with this? All of a sudden, everybody becomes a counselor and uh, an expert you know, subject matter expert on, on everything and anything today because you can access the internet and listen to sermons and so on. Is my true motivation to bring help or do I only want to feel needed? That's very, that's very telling, right? Is my true motivation to bring help or do I only want to feel needed? Feel important, you know? Uh, I feel like have a purpose in life. How much of my discussion about the situation could be classified as gossip? What was the result the last time I intruded into in a situation that was not my problem? How did that end up? What was the outcome of that? Has my opinion been sought by those involved? Did anybody come to me and say, hey, what do you think? You know, give me your, your opinion on this. Am I motivated by love for this person or by sense of my own importance? These are really uh, telling questions and searching. Am I basing my help on scripture or on my own opinion? Tenth, do I respond with anger when my advice is not accepted or is found to be flawed? You know, like in Ahithophel, he went and hung himself when when uh, Adonijah, I think it was, uh, didn't accept his, 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 his uh, counsel? Is that, so when, they, when my counsel is not accepted, do I get angry? Uh, and so on. So what is the antidote? What is the antidote to a busy body? And uh, we, find, we find this in an exhortation that Peter, uh, I'm sorry, Paul gives to the Thess Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 4.11, he says, And to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. What's he saying? Two things. He says, live quietly. In other words, don't be like a, a BOL gazette, like bread of life, you know, uh, newspaper, trying to figure out what, it, what everyone is up to and then going around and telling everyone else what that person is up to. Two, 
Be busy doing what the Lord has called you to do, and don't be busy in other people's affairs. But now, verse 16 tells us that there is a suffering that brings honor to Christ. Look with me at verse 16. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. He says, if anyone suffers as a Christian, the word in Greek is Christianos, followers of Christ. This appears three times in, in, in the New Testament. Acts eleven twenty six, where it says that the believers were first, uh, first called uh, Christians there in Antioch. Acts 26, 28, where uh, I think it was G King Agrippa, he's like, oh, to Paul, he's like, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And here in this verse, it was given to the believers by the Gentiles. But by the second century, it was used by believers as a term of honor. Uh, we see that in uh, Justin Martyrs referring to that in his uh, writing, uh, in his ap apologetic writing. Initially, they referred to themselves as disciples, as brethren, as believers, as the elect, and as saints. That was how they referred to themselves. It was the Gentiles that gave them the name uh, Christians. It was probably a derogatory term. But then they took, on, take it, took it on upon themselves as an honor. The Jews called them the Nazarenes. Another derogatory term. Do you remember their view of Nazareth? What did uh, Nathaniel say? Could anything good come out of Nazareth? Like, really? So that term was given to them by the Jews and, and as a derogatory term. And by the way, it is what Muslims call Christians because it's in the Quran. That's how the Quran refers to Christians as Nazarene, uh, uh, Nasara. So Peter says, let him not be ashamed. If you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. He says, unbelievers look down on you if you say you're a Christian. We see that more. But we're not to be ashamed of that glorious name, but see it as an honor. And glorify God that he has allowed us to be followers of Jesus Christ and to suffer reproach for his name. Like the apostles who were beaten, remember in Acts chapter 5, verse 41, first in chapter 4, they were warned, and they were let go, and they said, don't you dare preach anymore in that name. It says they went, and they filled all Jerusalem with the name of Christ. They came and apprehended him again, and this time Peter was even bolder in his confronting the, the leaders, and so they wanted to kill them, but then they refrained because Gamaliel says, don't do it. So what they did is they flogged them and they let them go, and it says, then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer this honor for the name. So there we have it, five reasons Peter gives us to rejoice in suffering for Christ. One, Trials are part of God's plan to strengthen our faith. Two, it is a privilege to share in Christ's suffering. Three, our joy now will be magnified at Christ's coming. Four, the spirit of glory and of God rests upon us. Five, it is an opportunity for us to glorify God. Now, there are many, or maybe some here and some online, uh, who don't want to become Christians and identify with Christ because you don't want to suffer reproach for his name. And I could tell you that your joy will not be magnified at the coming of Christ. Instead, he's going to say to you, well, since you don't want to identify with me, I don't want to identify with you either. And so he's going to send you to a place where you will not have Jesus. You, won't, you don't want Jesus. He's going to send you to a place where you don't have to have Jesus. But it is a place of eternal torment, a place called hell. You see, you fear what your friends and family would do 
to you if you were to become a Christian. You might lose them. They may mock you. But it tells us in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. When you're standing before Christ, what others think about you now won't matter. Your place in community won't matter. Your career and riches won't matter. The only thing that matters when you're standing before Christ is your relationship to Christ now. So, do you know him? Do you love him? Do you live your life to please him and honor him? That's what's going to stand, what's going to matter in that final day. I urge you today to turn from your sin of self-love because that's what it is. You don't want to believe because you know it may mean trouble for you. You love yourself too much. You love your honor too much. You love your name too much. It's self-love. You need to repent. You need to turn. You need to call upon the Lord. You need to see Him as more worthy than you and your name, and your honor, and your reputation, and your glory, and your riches. He's far more worthy. He came from heaven. He took on flesh. He left the glory of heaven. Friends, you think we're giving up something? We've not given up anything. He left the glories of heaven. Took on flesh, the place of of glory and majesty and honor. He took on flesh and came to be born Not in a palace, not in a castle, in a manger, in a trough, in a feeding trough with animals, in a barn, in the filth of this world, and came and lived that perfect, holy, beautiful life, and yet died for sins, the ugly, gruesome death upon the cross, bearing the wrath of sinners like you and me. And he gave his life as a ransom. He didn't need to do that. And you're going to cling to your little name and your little domain and your little riches here while the Son of God left heaven to give his life for you? Friends, I urge you today Today is a day of salvation. Call upon the Lord before it's too late. There's no guarantee. We had a memorial service of a baby this week. Don't, death has no respect of persons. You cannot stop it. You and I are subject to death. Any moment, any day, any time. Call upon the Lord today that you might be saved. And whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you and praise you, Lord, for these blessings, the privilege of being children of God, being brought into the family of God, Lord of forgiven, pardoned, cleansed, washed, given a hope and a future, having the joy of eternal life. We come before you, Father, and confess that, Lord, we have not responded the way that we ought to, Lord, when in the time of trial. Forgive us for complaining. Forgive us, O God, Lord, for questioning your wisdom, questioning your goodness, questioning your presence and nearness. Forgive us. We pray, Lord, by your grace, you would help us to face trials in a way that glorifies you, that we would desire to to know more of the power of Christ, more of the fellowship of his suffering, more of his nearness, more of his presence, that we may be more and more conformed to his image. 
Bless your word, Lord, that it would sanctify your people. We pray any who are here, Lord, who don't know you. Oh, Father, that are fearful, that are fearful to own the name of Christ, that are fearful, that, are, that love themselves too much to give up, Lord, to give up their reputation, to give up their wealth, to give up whatever it takes to own Christ. Oh, Father, I pray that today your Holy Spirit would lay hold of them and would make Christ to be precious, more precious than anything that they're holding on to. Show them the glory of Christ. Show them the greatness of Christ. Show them the love of Christ. Show them the mercy of Christ. Show them, Lord, the wrath of Christ. And they would flee from the wrath to come. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We will be partaking of the Lord's Supper in a few moments. We ask you to take a few moments to meditate on the Word, and if the Holy Spirit convicted you of certain sins, that you would confess them, that you would own them. And then uh, once the brethren come and uh, lead us in, in worship and singing, that you would uh, come forward, take the elements back to your seats, we'll partake together. Now, who are those who are to come to the Lord's table? It's those who are born again, those who have received Christ, those who have put their trust in Christ, those who are not ashamed of Christ, who have owned him as their Savior and Lord, who are willing to partake, forsake and whatever it takes and have made him to be the treasure and pleasure of their lives. Those who are displeased with themselves because of their sins, but who nevertheless trust that their sins are pardoned, that their continuing weakness is covered by the suffering and death of Christ, and who also desire more and more to strengthen their faith. Whenever you're done meditating on the word of God that was preached to us, we ask that you stand and we're going to sing together. It is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate 
shed his own blood for my soul. Remember, God has his hand on the, on the, uh, the heat, the heat dial. So we praise God that even through great trial, as the author of this hymn went through, that he could say, it is well with his soul. When peace like a
Our life's a vapor, we're a moment, but he is forever. Today we heard reasons to rejoice in our suffering for Christ. When unbelief battles belief, we shouldn't think that the fiery trials are strange. And not just not strange, but actually it's an occasion for joy. We're blessed. The glory of the Lord is resting on us. Well, how is that? Well, it gets back to the the heart of the gospel. When we are joined with Christ in his death, we are joined in his burial. When we are joined in his burial, we're joined in his resurrection. When we're joined in his resurrection, we're joined in his ascension. When you're connected with Christ, you're connected all the way through. Amen? Amen. And And the Lord tells us, If you want to keep your life, you're going to lose it. If you want to give up your life, then you'll find it. And the the world tells us, you're foolish. You're throwing away your life. And we say, we are giving up our lives to the one, the only one, the creator, the one who tells us what life is about. And you know what? We do want to throw something away. 
We want to throw away our sin and our guilt. And there's only one who takes it. Only Jesus. He forgives us and He writes the law in our hearts. And that's the heart of the new covenant. And we celebrate that when we celebrate the gospel. He takes away our sins and He gives us new life. And Jesus is not only our example in His suffering, but He is our Savior because of His suffering. And His suffering is our good news. That's the Gospel. And that's what we celebrate. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Jesus who bore our sins in His body on the tree and by His stripes we are healed. Thank You for our union with Christ. Amen. His body broken, His blood shed. Our union with Christ. Let's partake together. Our last song is quite fitting as we will rejoice in our salvation. Amen, brethren, let us rejoice for he has come.
dead will rise from the land and sea, all his people will ascend. We will reign with him for eternity. Rejoice, all the church rejoice. Bow your heads for the closing benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all times and now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated for a moment. I have a few announcements here. Um, we have some booklets uh, here that uh, we encourage you to take, and uh, they're available at the table. Uh, who will be king? This is, a, a, I believe this is more of a children one. Uh, ultimate questions. Uh, these are questions having to do with uh, things of why am I here? What, what is, why, what about death? What about religion? Very good booklet. Has been around for a long time. It's a nice compact size that you could uh, use. And then the gospel of Jesus Christ. So as you have opportunity with your family, if you could uh, uh, share some of those booklets, they're available on the table for you to take uh, with you. Uh, two, there's a limited number of these journals that we, uh, our church has, has gone through, basically through the year, uh, going through the, uh, the, the Bible with, uh, and the Psalm, through the New Testament and Psalms, in a year, and uh, you basically uh, jot down notes and so on, but it walks you through that. Uh, it's a calendar uh, for your reading plan, and it's available. Few of them are available somewhere. Uh, see Pastor Joe if you want one. There's about 20 using it. If you're committed, to, right. You heard that, right? If you're committed to doing it, we, we've done it when we first got them, and it was a blessing. Uh, there's Zoom prayer meeting this Tuesday coming up. God willing, 7.15, an uh, email will come out. Uh, there's a Christmas hymn sing, Tuesday, December 22nd. We don't know the exact time just yet, but uh, it'll be in the email at some point. Uh, it'll be here in Wayne, and there will be some refreshments safely provided. Uh, bold kids uh, at 2.30, Dave, David? It's 2 o'clock now? 2.30, okay, 2.30, bold kids today, this afternoon. And uh, we also, when, uh, when brethren join the congregation, uh, we, they have opportunity to give their testimony. And uh, in 2015, our sister Peggy, uh, became a member, but she hadn't had a chance to share her testimony, so uh, she would like to share her testimony with us, so come on up. Hi everybody, how are you? This isn't going to be a long, uh, this isn't going to be a long testimony, but uh, I'm going to tell you about my testimony. Um, this part of it's taken from Psalm 86:13. For great is your mercy toward me, and you have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. Um, the Lord Jesus saved me at the age of 52. I was a smoker. I smoked cigarettes for my God. Every day I had to have a cigarette and, you know, oh my God, until my lung collapsed and I was in the hospital. I cried out to God to help me. I was scared and did not want to die, even though I almost did. It was a very scary moment, dark moment of my life. You know, I was on death's door. Um, my friend Danielle, who's a woman in the Lord in my building, I became friends with her when I moved to the building 10 years ago. 
took me to church where I learned about the gospel in Christ. I confessed to Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I repented from my sins. I was sexually active, too, in my younger day as a sinner, as we all have sin in our lives, and lived the way I wanted. I learned a lot about Christ, but was getting hungry for more. I was baptized and felt excited that Jesus would let me be part of him more. And I just felt thrilled when the Holy Spirit came to live in my life. And um, so my friend Debbie told me to come to Bread of Life and meet Pastor Joe. And so I came to Bread of Life. I did. Boy, was my heart open to a lot more of scripture. And I remember Jim Holden, the system theology book when you had the class. And I bought the book. And um, I have four chapters to go. That's how long it's taken me, but I'm getting there. Um, <laughs> I was open to new truth, scripture, taught, death, baptisms I saw in this church. So thankfully, and marriages, and you know, also people passing too. I was thankful to the Lord for this and being mentored by my brothers and sisters. I learned to listen, so that's how I learned. And I have a mentor in the back room there named Karen who's helped me too, along with all my other brothers and sisters. So I want to say thank you all for that. Uh, Gwyneth, now having brothers and sisters helping you and being in the Lord has helped me too. And um, I'm just thankful to be in this church because I learned a lot. Thank you. Let's pray for our sister. Heavenly Father, we praise you for your amazing grace that is called a sinner, Lord, from a way of death and hell to yourself and to fellowship with you and bringing her part to be part of your family. Thank you, Lord, for your leading in her life, for your spirit's work in her, for uh, her desire to give testimony, Lord, to the work of God, to testify of the greatness of Jesus in her life. Thank you, Father, that she was at death's door and you reached her. Lord, we bless your name. You are no respecter of persons or times, but you have your people and you will save them. Lord, may you use our sister for your glory and, and may she continue to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus. May you keep her, may you use her in her apartment uh, complex as well as in her work to be a testimony of Christ, Lord, that they would see Christ in her. Through her testimony, others would come to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen. All right, God bless, and uh, please fellowship. What? Oh, okay, there's some uh, eggs that our town gives out, uh, and uh, they're extra. They're in the refrigerator. If, you're, if any of you would like to take a dozen, uh, help yourself. <laughs>